How are you? I'm great. You're good. I'm glad to yeah. hear it. You've been, you, it's been busy for you. I see you've been doing a lot of chatting about the record. Man, I've, it's been a long time since we did the whole <laughs> releasing an album thing. You forget. <laughs> you forget. It's an interesting thing to do, right? Because um, coming out of the pandemic, I think there was like, when I was doing research for this interview, I think there there would be artists who um, experienced the pandemic and and sort of gave themselves a, a bit of a break to stop making anything, you know? I know folks who got into gardening and never wrote a song once, but I was interested that you and Regine never really stopped making music. Can you, can you talk a little bit about what that time was like for you? Well, we had sort of, we were just getting started. Um, we were in a studio in New Orleans and, and we actually just cut the first version of end of the empire. Um, and we, we, I think we had age of anxiety at that point. We were working on a couple songs and checked my phone and I was like, Oh, the borders to Canada are closing. Um, like it's go time. Like I feel like I've been preparing for my whole life for the end of the world to finally be happy. It's like, it's happening. Were you a bit of a prepper? Like were you, were you hoarding Sprite down in gas containers in your basement or anything? No, unfortunately. No. All right, right. I had no toilet paper, just like all the rest of us. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's like you spend your whole life, you know, watching science fiction and reading science fiction. And you're like, oh, wow, this is eerily familiar. Um, so, yeah, we were – we had just started and, and, um, and then I was actually calculating – that would have been in, f- what, February? Yeah, late February 2020, yeah. Late Feb, and then by the time I was able to get the band together, um, it was late October. So March, April, May, June, July, August, September. So seven, eight months of like unplanned writing time. Um, and the whole time just trying to logistically jump through hoops and figure out how to get everyone together. Um, so yeah, it was, it was definitely... An intense, I mean, we, and we were already in this full-on writing mode, so it was like once that ship has sailed, unfortunately, you don't get to, it, you kind of have to listen when you're inspired. So, it's like, that, 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 I mean, that's, that's sort of what I'm curious about. Like, unplanned time off is unplanned writing mode. You wanted to keep writing. You wanted to still keep going, even if it was just you and, and, and herself at the piano. I mean, it was sort of survival, to be honest. I mean, it was such a bizarre time. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm someone who um, I really started writing music when I was 15. I went away to boarding school and I was, you know, my family was in Texas and I was in New Hampshire and it was like winter time, And I was so depressed, you know, just like so just profoundly homesick and depressed. But I mean, it was exci- it was exciting because I was you know, meeting all these really interesting kids who were really smart. And, you know, I had an amazing English teacher and I was like, really like on a certain level, uh, it was really exciting. But then I was like barely surviving. And for me, music was like always my, just, just my lifeline, you know? Um, And so it wasn't, it didn't really start as like a pastime or anything for me. It almost started more like medicine. Um, and so then I think when this all went down, it, it was, it was, it felt very familiar. It almost felt like, like a flashback to that time where it's like you're, that's your lifeboat. You just hold on, hold on to dear life. Does that, I have a couple questions on that. One, what were the songs you were writing at boarding school like? Um, I had a roommate, we would sort of, I mean, I had a four track, um, cassette four track and, a lot of it was sort of jokey, like, you know, it's like we, we were like, oh, we're not making songs like like we would, it was like it was like a lot of it was couched in this sort of like pretending to be jokey sort of thing. Um, like ironic, funny songs or were they like not like not like not like Weird Al. Funny. <laughs> you were you were writing parody songs of. Yeah, I understand. Oh, I'm trying to think of an example. Like I the mean, Mountain Goats or something like that. Like it's kind of funny and acerbic and, you know, I don't know. Maybe it was more like we were too self-conscious to like admit that we cared sort of. Um, and we were just it was just like these little dumb little 
things, you know, we'd record on the four track and then, um, but, you know, just like dozens of them. And, and then, you know, and then at a certain point I was like, I think that I really care about this and I'm, I'm just <laughs> pretending not to care about it because I think it'll make me seem less lame or something like that. Yeah. There's a great, there's a great irony there that, you know, y- when you say something like, um, uh, you know, we were, we were trying to couch the fact that we did care because we thought it was very uncool to care. Like, I feel like your band in some ways unlocked for a lot of us, like the coolness of caring. I got over the not caring thing pretty quick. Yeah. I was like, well, I'm, I, this is not me really. Um, and then, you know, I was, I, uh, you know, like a lot of people, I was, it was like more of a cover band. Um, and, but I, you know, I'm, I, I think the first time we played, we play, we did a cover of um, Just Like Heaven by The Cure. That was like my first time playing in front of people. Oh, yeah. And I had to sit down because I couldn't stand up and play guitar at the same time. You know, it's just like just a lousy high school guitar player. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think just because my family is so musical, like my grandfather played in big bands and my mother's an incredible musician. And it was always, they never really presented it to me that music was something that like an occupation that was just sort of something that you did every day um so i never had any existential doubts of like oh could i be a musician when i grew up you know it's like it seemed like that was the most normal thing i could do in a lot of ways i, I want to talk about your, your grandfather a little bit later but i want to go back to the idea that you were writing as a lifeline through this pandemic and it reminded you of those those early days in new hampshire when you were writing as a lifeline when you were at boarding school away from the family when you're writing these songs at home during the pandemic, are they in any way different because there's not the immediacy of like, oh, in a couple of days, I might be able to show this to the band or in a couple of months, I might be able to play these on stage with the band? Well, I mean, to be honest, they're, the process for writing a record is very long. So, I mean, it's it, it's not that uncommon for me to spend a year writing without anyone in the band hearing anything. It's like we, you know, yeah. um, Regine and I are always just sort of writing, you know, it's just sort of like, you know, when the, when the, when the spirit comes, you know what I mean? It's like, I think, I remember reading something with Neil Young where he, like, his family had an understanding. It's like at any point, if he, like, gave the sign, then he had a pass just to disappear immediately and, you know, go get the song down. So I I think it's the same thing. It's like, um, my son knows he's like, when he, if he's asked me the same question like nine times in a row and I haven't responded, the dad is probably, you know, thinking about a melody or thinking about like a turn of phrase or something like that. I I have a couple of friends who are songwriters and, and I'll often, they'll often say to me like, sorry, I didn't text back. I have a song. I had to write a song. And I, yeah. I have to be understanding of that. You're right. Yeah, you have to. I mean, <laughs> I've done it enough times where you don't listen and then it's gone forever. And you're like, well, that's gone forever. <laughs> when, when you announced the um, when you announced the new record, you also put out a letter talking about a book from your childhood that had the word we stamped on the cover. And this was a book that I only knew in reference to other books. Um I wonder if you could tell people who aren't familiar with it, tell me a little bit about the book and um, maybe how it was influencing you. Well, I mean, it's funny because the, the original book, when I was a very little kid, my grandmother was, um, it, this is my family in Maine, my kind of New England family, actually who have roots in Canada. I definitely have some ancestors that come from your part of the world, from St. John's and, 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 uh, and, um, and New Brunswick and, and lots of butlers around my way too, right? Yeah, I don't yeah. know. It's it's a little hazy back there, but there's yeah. definitely some some because you know where my where my parents live is called Acadia, um, and it, it was like you know the the French uh, passed through there as well, and it was like a lot of it's it's very um, French Canadian. So yeah, like my grandparents were very like I remember like. My grandfather was obsessed with um, like Kipling. They would read me a lot of that sort of stuff, which really, I, I I trace a lot of my love of language back to that. Just like hearing Kipling stories, but she read me. I believe it was like a uh, it was like a biography of um, of uh, uh, what's his name the um, who flew the first the first flight across Lindbergh. Uh, Lindbergh. 
because that generation, like the Lindbergh flight was like big as big as the space like mission to the moon. It was like he was like the most famous person. Yeah, the Lindbergh baby kidnapping was like the biggest thing that had ever happened in history at that point. I don't, I don't even remember the book. I just I remember being really confused as to why it was called We as well. I was like, so I would just sort of I was like, We like, what does this mean? And then. When I moved to Montreal, I took a, uh, I was minoring in Russian literature and there's, um, I took a class on the twenties, like the right around the Re Russian revolution. And there's a book by, um, some Yatin that's called we that, uh, 1984 is based on and, and brave new world, but 1984 directly. Um, and Orwell was always one of my favorite, I mean, maybe the most influential writer on me. And I was like, wait, he got the entire story from this Russian story. And then there was just something that it resonated, the name resonated with me from when I was a kid. And it was like, just this, just this word, you know, like this very simple word and it, but it had this sort of depth of meaning to me personally. Was it influencing the songs on the record? It was more like, I realized that that's what the songs were. You know, it's like, I, cause I, like, I feel like in a sense, like every album we've ever done, I've had some seed of what it is like way back and you're just sort of remembering what it is as you go along you know it's like um like suburbs was an idea for like a science fiction film that i had when i was 17 and you know um there, there's always like some something that's already in there that you're trying to kind of uncover the layers of um oh. and with we i always knew i would do something called we i just didn't know it was this record until the record was almost written i was like oh this rec this, that's what this is. This record is we. I, I want to listen to one of the tracks off the record. I want to listen to a couple of tracks off the record today. So I, I want to start with this one. Rabbit hole. Plastic soul, yeah. So we rabbit hole, yeah, rabbit hole, yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk to me a little bit about age of anxiety. Well, I mean, um, rabbit hole, we did right. <laughs> wow. And uh, it was just. Regine was playing this little, we were working on a different song, I can't remember, and she was playing the chords, and I just, we just sort of like, stop everything, that, and I programmed this quick little drum machine thing, and um, it was just like one of those instinctive things where you're working on something totally different, and and um, it just the the atmosphere it, like th that song to me is almost more of a place than a song it like just had all it has all this like like it just felt like like when you when i say when you say rabbit hole it's like everyone knows what you're talking about it's like such a modern like everyone's been in a, in the rabbit hole where it's like you think you're looking for something and you end up finding something totally different you're on wikipedia reading one article and you end up three hours later reading about the history of baseball socks yeah exactly yeah, yeah follow this weird chain and you end up somewhere totally different. And, yeah. but I think that there's like also like a kind of deeper, you know, thing to it as well. And, um, it's interesting, like the, there's sort of a Bowie reference in it. Um, the second line is like plastic soul, plastic which is soul. What, what he called, uh, like kind of fame. He called plastic soul. It's like a genre. Um, and I, I had a portrait of him in the studio um and the first vocal take that's actually the song um i was singing it and my engineer and i finishing the take and we heard this sound uh, and we we're like what is that sound i took off my headphones and my phone which is on the other side of the studio started playing a song from low um like just of its own accord it like wasn't on a playlist or anything like that and it was in the same key and it was just like i have a video of it somewhere i'm gonna have to dig it out to um and it was just so <laughs> it, i was like i really don't even believe in that sort of stuff but it was like it is like it is what it is <laughs> like like hi david how's it going um 
so I don't know. I mean, it's there's a there's a lot there's a lot of uh, a lot in that song. You know, I understand the uh, I don't the word, until the world is made whole, one body, one soul. I think that's my favorite lyric in it. Why? Um, because that's what I'm waiting for. You know, just waiting for some sort of like healing and some sort of um, coming together and kind of hope some sort of hope through the through the blackness that's that's something i wanted to ask you about you know when i listen to so i'll say a couple of things here one is that you can listen to uh, an arcade fire song and have a great personal relationship with it and then you can read a review of an arcade fire song and realize you have no idea what it turns out you were wrong all along <laughs> And and what you thought the song was about when you heard it, it turns out, according to this person, it's 100% not what it's about. Um, but I, I'll talk about this. What I'll talk about what the song made me think of, and I don't think it's that far off, you know? Listening to Age of Anxiety made me think about a lot of things that a lot of us were dealing with through the pandemic. The idea of being separated from one another physically, the artifice of seeming like we were connected to one another through social media, which are, of course, these billion-dollar corporations. And how ultimately we live in a time when there's higher instances of anxiety and higher instances of depression. And we can attribute some of that stuff directly to, I mean, there's studies that exist that we can attribute that to, you know, increased use of social media, lack of community, lack of being close to one another. I wanted to know if you are immune from that. I like to believe that um, sometimes when I see people with like the millions and millions of followers or the people who are living the so-called successful life, whether they might be immune from the anxiety of our age? No, not at all, because it's, it's, it's completely contagious, you know? So it's like, I think that, um, I think that we sort of, we always project whatever we're going through onto everyone else. And it's like, it's sort of this weird feedback loop. Um, and it, it's like, it's almost like weather systems. You know what I mean? It's like, particularly over the last couple of years as we've been home, you can just see these big kind of weather systems of anxiety blowing through. And, um, you know, I, I just think it's, it's an aspect of just like, having way too much information and like and without really the and not enough connection just to like the here and now of kind of our day-to-day lives it's like we're constantly being pulled out of our pulled out of the moment um and so it's like i don't know i mean i i think every generation has sort of struggled with this and it's you know it's not like it's it's not like technology is bad and you know it, it it's it, it's nothing like that but it's 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 more just like trying to understand these like big weather systems that are affecting all of us is it affecting you how does it affect you personally um well i don't know i mean like all all music you know since we started as a band you know when we started the dream was to sell 10,000 records and quit our day job and make a second record and um the 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 way like the streaming has completely changed um basically has annihilated the record um and made it so that the record is not i don't mean the physical record i mean like the album is, is like the not, idea of a sequence of songs that one would listen to from beginning to end yeah it, it's not that's not in the protocol of how these things are set up so it's like no one is receiving the information in the way that, you know, it's, it's like I grew up listening to Beatles records and Bowie records and Clash records and 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 Radiohead records and Bjork records. It wasn't like um, a random jogging playlist of like, here's nine random Bjork songs with like a lot of other random, you know, with a PJ like, Harvey song in there or yeah, that kind of thing. I yeah, I mean, yeah. like. We would make we would make um you know obviously like uh cassette you know playlists and and that sort of thing um but i don't know is there a playlist that's better than like the white album i don't know it's like i actually read an article the other day where someone was like i fixed the white album like i removed all the boring songs and like here's the 10 songs that if they had done it it would have been great i'm like who are you again? Like, and if, why do you think that you can improve the freaking white album? Like, like, like. I like the idea of McCartney listening to that and going, nah, they're right. Yeah, you oh, know what? 
<laughs> Why weren't they there when we were doing it? Like, like Bungalow Bill is a real stinker, you know. It's, like, it's, like, it's just like it's it's so absurd. It's like, like oh man, if only they could have come in a time machine and helped us make our album. Like you know. Okay, so, so I, I understand. So that 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 in one instance, what we're talking about is this this digital age has has taken has robbed us of of that experience, which you as an artist has is, has changed what you do and how you people experience what you do. I understand that. I mean, we're still doing it, you know, and but we're sort of doing it not necessarily for now. It's just like for twenty years from now, when people are like, oh man. Remember this thing that people used to do and be like, we were doing it. We were still doing it. Like, check it out. Um, I don't know. That's sort of how I'm thinking about it. You're also thinking about it in terms of what, what you said to me just before I asked you about that, which is that you hope there's some way we can be made whole again. And that, I should be clear, obviously, when and I are talking about a lot more than just, you know, Spotify and, and the music industry, you know, we're, we're talking about sort of a fracture, fracturing of, of, of humanity and, and civilization. At least that's what I'm thinking about. It, the, the back half of the album, if you don't mind me saying so, is, is a very hopeful record in a time when it's not easy to be hopeful. Can you talk to me a little bit about your relationship with hope? Well, I mean, today um, there's a song on the, uh, you know, the fourth part of End of the Empire called Sagittarius A. And um, there's a the international, like, um, there's a huge international uh, push to get imaging of this black hole. And today they just announced that they have the first images of this black hole. And so Regina and I played for the, like, super nerdy, like, press conference of all these scientists and basically in order to get this image it's like these 12 giant telescopes all over the planet pointed at this tiny little pinprick of space for 10 years um just like complete and total collaboration beyond the borders of government like just trying to get a deeper understanding of our of our own galaxy you know and so i look at things like that and and like to me, that's just exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, like that's, it's like you're accomplishing things that would be impossible to accomplish without actual deep collaboration, sharing of information. Um, and to me that, that is the promise of technology and that's the promise of the internet. And that's the, that's the potential, um, of all this stuff, you know? So, I mean, I, I, I see a tremendous amount of hope in that. And I, I do think that the world is, is, you know, is getting better. I mean, I, I was, I was even reading that, you know, it's like with all this stuff about science and pe people anti-vax and all this sort of stuff and that people's faith in science has actually grown since the pandemic. Like if you actually poll people, like people, it, the net impact has been that people believe more in science than they did before. Just all the noise around it is like, is all this sort of anti-science rhetoric, but it's like the, you know, it's, it's a very like annoyingly and painfully slow arc, but it, you know, I, I do think it bends towards justice. Uh, is it important to you to sing about hope on your records? I mean, it's, I think it can be anything. I mean, like, I think that I think there's hope in just sort of um, in pain as well. I don't think they're they're so different from each other. I think that um, you know I've been very uplifted by Billie Holiday and and Nina Simone, and I've been very uplifted by music that was made by people who are in a tremendous amount of pain and just trying to um, come to terms with 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 that. You know, so I I don't think it's like. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think I think it's I think it's all around us. It's it's very easy to get beat down. I mean, I'll I'll, I'll go for months and months where I'm just like, oh man, what is the point of all this? Yeah. It's like you know, just like you just feel like you're hitting your head against a wall. Um, but there's always, I mean, particularly with, you know, with my son, it's like you just see, I you know, so much potential and so much like 
such a um, a beautiful uh, posture towards the world, and you know, for me, it just gives me a lot of a lot of hope. I wanted to ask about that, and I wanted to play you a song that made me think about that. But I want to say now that this is a pre-tape, and if I play the song and you don't want to fucking talk about it, just let me know, okay? Okay, okay take a listen. Look out, kid. Trust your mind, but you can't trust it every time. You know it plays tricks on you, and it don't give a damn if you're happy or you're sad. But if you've lost it, don't feel bad, because it's all right to be sad. That's Unconditional Lookout Kid from Arcade Fire's album, We... I love this song. Um, I, I'll just ask broadly, what, what can you tell me about writing it? Um, it was... It's sort of like a Soweto sort of um, vibe the, in, the, in the rhythm. Um, and I don't know, I was, I was sort of thinking about, you know... My son, I, I was thinking about my own experience in junior high and high school and, and just like how difficult it was and trying to imagine myself now trying to go through what I went through then. And like, I just genuinely don't know if I would have survived. Like, you know what I mean? Like within this kind of new era, like there's so much, um, it's so easy to tear other people down and to like kind of, you know, just... It, there's so many um, new ways to kind of hurt each other, you know, yeah. um, and it's uh, it's very harrowing, you know, and just thinking about like my son that I just love, you know, to the ends of the earth. And you're just like, like w my feeling was just like, you're just going to really need to be able to take a punch and keep going and really just like it's not not all sunshine. It's going to be a lot of like really you're just going to have to have a thick skin and really kind of, um, and so, you know, that was sort of the, the root of it, I guess. Did you, have you played it for him? Yeah, of course. I mean, he's, 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 uh, he's always, he's always in there. I mean, does he like it? I don't know. He does now. I'd ask him, like, <laughs> you know, probably like, I know, wanna, I know. I was thinking that I was thinking the difference between or something just to mess with me. Yeah, I know. I, 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 I understand it. You had a hard time in junior high and high school. Yeah, of course. Who didn't? Some people didn't. I don't know. But I think, I, but I think they're having a hard time now. Yeah, no one that I hang out with had a great junior high, but I mean. Oh, I think it's the death years. I think they're, they're, it's the most deathly of the, of the years in junior high. Oh, brutal. Yeah, really, really rough. Um, all right, I, I promised I was going to talk to you about this. I want to talk to you about it. Just take a listen to this. Do you know, do you recognize that? Yeah, it makes me cry. I miss him a lot. Yeah. That, that's your grandfather? Yeah. What was his name? Uh, Alvino. Do you, want, do you want to take a second? We totally can. No, it's cool. Um, no, he's... Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. He's, uh, he was a very special dude. Great musician. Yeah, amazing. The best. He was the second jazz guitar player in New York City. You know, he was really? basically, the, yeah. Really? Yeah. I have his guitar that he got from Eddie Lang, who was the first jazz guitar player in New York City. It's like an old Gibson. Um, yeah, he was, uh, he, uh, yeah, his photos are all over my house. Like, you know, he, uh, he was, you know, in a lot of ways, definitely what I'm doing now is was from his influence. Not, not even anything he said, just, you know, how he was. Um, I know he definitely went through some shit in his life. You know, he was like in World War II and he uh, he was living in New York when the stock market crash happened. Um, but, you know, I've been it's he's he's someone whose memory we definitely keep alive. Do you do you, when, when do you remember? This is so cool. Like, when do you remember knowing that, hey, my, my grandfather is one of the cooler musicians 
I mean, we would visit him. He always had a studio. Um, he was like a very tech, you know, talk about someone having like a positive attitude towards technology because he yeah. was when he was a kid. He would build radios like when he was a little kid, like physically build the electronics. And he told me about like cutting down a tree with his dad and making his own radio tower. And he was obsessed with radio and he had his ham radio license, you know, since 1920 or something like that. Um, and so he was always really like kind of technical and really like the first transatlantic um, communications. It just he was so like that's he was obsessed with all that stuff. And so I remember visiting him and every day he'd go down in the basement. And you hear him like soloing like kind of Django Reinhardt do 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 like for an hour. And then you hear like nine or forty four is like and. And then he'd come up and eat lunch, and then he'd go downstairs, and you're like, do 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 like that was his whole life basically. It was just like the radio, and um, but yeah, when he passed, he died right around funeral. We'd, we'd named sort of funeral for him, and Regine and I were visiting his basement studio, and he had Pro Tools open, and was you know had a um, octave pedal on a guitar and recording bass like 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 using it to do bass sounds for a thing he was working on. And, you know, he was just like to the very end, like very interested and, and kind of wanting to see what happens next. So he must've been some proud of you. I, you know, I don't know if he could have related to the music. He, he, he was, a, he, you know, cause he was involved in, in the first prototype of the electric. And I think he always regretted it a little bit, you know, <laughs> what have I <laughs> done? Like, oh, no, like, it's cool. He's like, rock and roll is cool. Like, the energy is great, but you really should have heard Duke Ellington with, like, a, like a you know, 60-person orchestra. He's like, you have no idea what you're missing. <laughs> what you're missing, like, it was so good. <laughs> you, you said to me, uh, when I first played it, for you said, I think the way he was influenced me. Yeah. What, what do you mean? He wouldn't try to tell you anything. He wasn't, like, trying to, like... Like, I felt like I was talking to a 20 year old. It was like he was really interested and really like alive in the eyes and really like um, not like, I don't know, not like blustery and like you got to do it like this or whatever. He just was really in his own, just like very, um, I don't know, just a really, really beautiful guy. Not perfect, like, you know, yeah. definitely not perfect, but like just, just, I don't know, it kind of gave me a sense of like what life could be, you know. You said to me earlier that when you were in, because you, you came, your, your, your mom's a musician, because your grandfather's a musician, you, you kind of grew up with a lot of music in the house. It wasn't something that people did. It was just sort of surrounding you at all times. Was there was there a moment where you were like, I want to dedicate my life to this? Well, I sort of realized um, my mom's a harpist. And uh, when I was a kid, she would always, you know, be, I'd come home from school and she'd be playing Debussy or, you know, she was like, play a lot of jazz stuff. Um, and I would, when I was like, this is like maybe when I was, when we still lived in California, so I would have been like two, three years old, I would like put my head on the soundboard of the harp like this and she would play. So it's like, you would get the vibration of the instrument like on your head and it felt really cool. And I was visiting them this summer and I put my head on her harp and plucked a string and I just, it was this out of body experience. It's like, you know, when you smell something from your childhood or whatever, it was like that, but on acid, it was like, like it brought me back immediately to being a kid. And it was like, I sort of had this realization that it's like, that music is, is really, it's a spirit. You know what I mean? It's like, it's not like a practice. It's like, there's a spiritual dimension to it. It's like this, this, my head, my ear on the soundboard, like that's, it got into me. It was just like, like the vibration of that thing hit my brain and my brain was like wired differently from then on. It was like, okay, my brain now, it, it, it like did, it did something. I don't know, I don't know how to explain it, but it was like, it was really, really um, otherworldly. I was like, oh man, that's, that's where it came from. Those moments, hey, like those one little tiny moments. There's no way you could have predicted that when you put your head on that harp that that was what would have happened, you know? I mean, I was like, it, it, 
it, it reminded me I was watching a documentary on um, on um, Vonnegut. And he, I watched that documentary, the the one of yeah. the one made by his Robert B. Whitey, the one made about like trying to make a documentary about Vonnegut. Exactly, yeah. yeah. But he had the story of like being in the war, and he put his head against a tree, and saw everything that was about to happen. It's like the tree. It's like this like weird mystical thing. It was like literally just like he did this, and it was like he saw the whole war. And then I think he spent the rest of his life just trying to make sense of it. He's like, am I a crazy person or, you know, like, um, but I don't know. It, it was that sort of feeling, actually. When you saw that, you went, I know, I know, what the, I know that. I know, I know what that can be. I mean, man, like I, I try to not be mystical and spiritual because my dad's a scientist and, you know, I do my best. I'm like the most skeptical person. But every once in a while, it's like David Bowie comes in your studio and and says, what's up? And you're like, oh, man, there's a lot. There's a lot about this, about all of this that we don't understand. So you, you, you end up pursuing music. It, it, it sort of takes over, you know, famously, you're, you're in Montreal. Arcade Fire starts, becomes really, really big. And, and you mentioned Funeral earlier. I want to play just a little bit of, of Funeral. I just want to take a listen to this. If the children don't grow up, our bodies get bigger, but our hearts get torn. Uh, wake up from funeral, Arcade Fire's 2004 debut. When I couldn't have been, I've been holding on on this one. Like I could not have been in a better place for this record to have hit me. I was born in '87, so I was in like late high school when I heard this record, and it was, it was. I mean, everyone. It didn't matter what else you were into. Loved this record. Like I loved bluegrass and Irish music and funeral. My friends loved The Smiths and Joy Division and Funeral. My friends loved hip hop, country music, and and Funeral. And I've been thinking a lot about it, you know. Well, first off, I, sh- I shouldn't cut you off, you know. Like it, it was a it was a pretty profound record for a lot of people. Shout out Arlen Thompson on the drums on that from Wolf Parade. That was that when we were before we had a drummer. Um. Yeah, I mean, I remember playing that song for five people. I remember we played that song many times when there were more people in the band than people in the audience, and we would still sing it like that, just so over the top, like like we were going to war every single show. Um, and I think we've tried to hold on to that mentality since then. That's what I'm curious about. Like, I think a lot of the songs were so meaningful to a lot of people who love that record because it was about this sort of transitional time in our lives. And the songs were about, we're talking about death and talking about our parents and talking about growing older. And I was only getting ready for this interview in that I sort of realized like he was just in his twenties too. So being now maybe a little bit older, a few decades removed from that, how do you look back on the perspective of the person who wrote those songs? I mean, we're always, we're constantly changing and, you know, it's like, um, I, it's interesting. It's like, we, I think we always wanted to start, like, when I met Regine, our influences were so, you know, we had certain things that we came together on, but we had a very broad set of influences. And I think that when we put out Funeral, to my ears, the, you know, the difference between Seven Kettles and power out and Haiti and rebellion. It's like, there's a really, there's a breadth of, of kind of the, some of the underpinning. I think we pulled off a pretty big magic trick, making, insisting that it all makes sense together. Um, but I, I feel like, I, I feel like we're still trying to explore the outer reaches of all that stuff that made us want to do it in the first place and, and trying to learn more about ourselves and, um, you know, it's like, I think it's very natural. It's like when something's brand new and people are hearing something for the first time, it's like there's this excitement of like, this is new, you know? And, uh, you know, 
I don't know. It's like, it's, uh, we, f being on the inside, it, it doesn't feel any different to us. You know what I mean? It's like, it's still like each new song is kind of new to us and we're still trying to explore something that we haven't said before. I'm just thinking about, I'm stuck by what you said there about you playing that song to, you know, five, I've, I've seen some of those videos. Like I remember when, yeah, I remember when you guys won the Grammy, there were like in, in Canada, all these messages started going up and like everyone happened to have a video of you guys at the Rivoli or happened to have a video of you guys playing, you know, in, in, in front of like eight people uh, and was sort of sending it back and forth to one another. It, it, it blew up so quickly. I mean, it wasn't that quick. I mean, the record didn't come out for six months in the UK. You know, it came out in US and Canada. So, like, it might have felt quick to you guys, but to us, it's like we had been toiling for years and years. You know, it's like, I mean, I'm very grateful that we weren't 18, that, you know, I was 22, 23, and, and, and sort of, had a little bit more of a head on head on our shoulders because I you know I've seen a lot of bands that just get a lot of smoke blown at them and they can't you know kind of that's the death nail it's like you can never it's like you can never recapture the magic of the thing that you did when you weren't thinking about it or whatever and and for us I was like um, had the instinct just to you know just to run away and just just keep doing it and not not let not let that stuff affect us too much but i mean of course it does because it's like you know you're, you're still in the world and you're still a human but yeah but it, it could have been a lot worse you know no i mean it's been a, it's man it's been a trip i mean it, it's it's um it's uh and you know we're still quite young by country music standards <laughs> <laughs> I want to get a sh I want to get a shirt that says I'm still young by country music standards. All Let's, the blues guys are, you know. Yeah, I know. I got, you don't really get good until you're seventy. <laughs> I got I guess got a couple of questions left for you, and you've been really generous with your time. Um, one only because I, I heard this story and I wanted to get it from you because I, I I loved it so much. Can you tell the story about the time you were on stage and you look out and Bowie's there and David Burner is there? I mean, that was the first time we were playing the Bowery um, in New York, and it was. It was a we were playing with the hidden cameras who um, still some of those hidden camera shows back in the day are still some of the best shows I've ever been to like what an incredible band um, and yeah we, I mean we were still in the van Jeremy our drummer we were paying double per diems to be our tour manager so he got like instead of twenty dollars a day he got like forty dollars which was yeah. A lot of money. Yeah. I'm talking American dollars here. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> Ooh, well, okay. Never mind. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, like, every single show it would be like we would just barely arrive. We would load all of our crap in through the door. The audience would already be there. We would be sound checking in front of a full room. You know, just like no curtain, <laughs> no like just like you just be like one, two, is this on? Hello, more vocal. Okay. And then we would just Da -na 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 -na. It's like straight into wake up, like just straight to 11, <laughs> like no, no, like pre-show walk on music. No, nothing to set the mood. Just like, like, OK, we're going to we're we're here to kill. Um, and yeah, it was it was really a trip. I remember seeing Bowie up in the up in the balcony and David Byrne. We met David after um, after the show. We met Bowie a couple of weeks later when we played the Irving Plaza um, yeah, I mean, I've thought about it. I mean, it's like both of them were probably in their, f Bowie was maybe 60, late fifties then. David Burns, like maybe 10 years younger. Um, but I think about that sometimes, like why, what, why were they there? Why did they, like, what, it, what is it about those artists that made them still so interested in Hungary that they would be coming to check out some Canadian punk band, like, at the Bowery? You know, it's like they both of them had already accomplished enough for 10 lifetimes. And um, and I, I don't know. It's something that for myself I try to keep in mind just to kind of stay interested and stay, stay like, I don't know, just be interested. How did you feel when you were back at the Bowery there a little while ago doing that gig? 
It was cool. I mean, the energy, you know, of the world starting to slowly come back to life is really a beautiful thing to behold. Um, it's 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 overwhelming. Um, yeah, I mean, you can probably find a video of it somewhere, but I did at the the last show. I said something about Bowie, and I was like, and we were playing Rabbit Hole, and I I said like. You know, like, hi, David, like, I wonder, it, like, I feel like you're here right now. And the a digital piano just cut, like, on the chord, like, in the most bizarre. Regine and I looked at each other like, what the hell? Um, so that was another weird experience. I want to watch the Unsolved Mysteries Twilight Zone Wynn Butler David Bowie episode. I think maybe we will. Maybe I'll do a seance and we'll uh, get him to answer these questions himself. Um, lovely to meet you. Thanks for thanks for the time. Yeah. Uh, Wim Butler was my guest. He's in the band Arcade Fire. Their latest album is called We, and it's out everywhere now. <laughs>